<laughs> Welcome to all, all of you. Sorry for that. <laughs> it's, the technical are always a surprise for me until today, I have to say. So um, um, thanks, Nils, for your uh, kindly words. And um, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to hear, to, to, to have the uh, possibility to moderate this morning. And the first one is Dalia, Dr. Daniel Nasser. Uh, welcome here uh, in our uh, conference. And I will uh, just uh, start uh, to say a few words uh, of your uh, career. Uh, um, not that much, uh, but uh, the most important things I would say. Uh, Dalia Nasser is a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Sydney a key researcher at the Sydney Environment Institute and a member of the research initiative Multispecies Justice. It sounds good, I don't know about, but it sounds really good. She works on the history of 19th century German philosophy with a special focus on the idea of nature and the emergence of the ecological thinking in the first part of the century. She is the author of the, the just uh, publication um, she is author of the Romantic Absolute, Being and Knowing in German Romantic Philosophy. Maybe we hear about from you in your talk. And she is editor of the Relevance of Romanticism in Oxford University Press 2014. The first one was at Chicago University at the, in the same year. So we are very happy to have you here um, in this conference. And we are looking forward to your talk. Um, yes, uh, the floor is open for you. Uh, the title of your uh, talk will be Alexander from Humboldt, uh, the Aesthetic Foundation, Foundations of Ecology and Why Matters Today. Please, it's your floor. Thank you very much, Georg. And um, thank you, Niels, and everyone for inviting me here today and for being here today. Um, so I want to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on whose lands I am here today, on whose lands the University of Sydney um, stands. I pay respects to their elders, past and present, and want to emphasize the need to learn with and from their knowledge and deep kinship with country. Um, so Georg mentioned that I had a um, couple of things from 2014, quite a while ago, but actually today's talk comes from another book that I've just finished and that's gonna be coming out next year, titled Romantic Empiricism, Nature, Art and Ecology from Hera to Humboldt. And this talk will give you a kind of an overview of both the systematic and the historical interests of the book, and in particular, for the reasons why I regard art and aesthetics to be absolutely necessary for our response to the environmental crisis. So let me begin. We know about the environmental crisis, and we have known about it for several decades now. We know that we are on the brink of the sixth mass, mass extinction. We know about the acid, acidification of surface water, the depletion of the ozone layer, the rising sea levels, and the billions of animals that were killed in Australia's 2019-2020 fire seasons. We know. And yet, despite our widespread knowledge of the facts and figures, we continue to do very little. Why? This is the most important question. And answers have been given by psychologists, sociologists, and political scientists. They argue, for instance, that this crisis is simply too hard for us to visualize and imagine. And so instead of facing it, we simply deny it. Or alternately, they claim that we feel immobilized by its magnitude. Of course, sociologists and political scientists have also argued that we have been fooled by the fuel industry or by the politicians whose interests are focused on short-term short economic profits. These answers are all true. <laughs> 
but they don't get to the heart of the question. For the question ultimately concerns knowledge. We know, and yet we do not act. The implication is that there is a split between what we know and what we do. It's as if we know, but don't really know. Our knowledge doesn't move us. This tells us something. It tells us that the ecological crisis is not only a biophysical crisis, but also a crisis of knowledge. A crisis to ha that has to do with a separation between knowing and acting. And this means that the ecological crisis doesn't only challenge our most trusted concepts, ideals, and norms, as many have argued, but also, and as I will argue today, it challenges the very way we know. It tells us that knowledge as it is currently practiced is inadequate, problematic, even dangerous in a time of crisis. This at least is the premise I'm operating with today. And my claim is that our academic ways of knowing are complicit. More specifically, my claim is that the creation of disciplinary boundaries coupled with an understanding of knowing as dispassionate or disinterested has led to the separation of knowing and acting and has thus given us an impotent form of knowing a knowing that knows, but doesn't really know. To make this claim, I'm going to offer an, an example of an alternative way of knowing, a way of knowing that is founded on a deep collaboration between the arts and sciences, between feeling and reflection, between lived experience and explanation. In other words, to justify my claim, I'm going to offer an example of what knowing ought to look like in a time of crisis. In this way, I hope to indirectly show you how our current practices of knowing fall short of this ideal. But first, a few words about history. After all, this alternative way of knowing was not historically rare but rather widespread. In pre-modern and even modern Europe, the distinction between the arts and sciences was not always or even generally relevant. Often the same person who, understood, who undertook experiential and observational work was also engaged in philosophy, poetry, and the visual arts. The two tasks were not regarded as opposed, but as part of one project. From the Renaissance to the mid 19th century, so-called scientists employed methods that we now associate with the arts. They sought to interpret nature in the same way that one interprets a historical or literary text. They used illustrations and travel writing to extend their understanding of geography and plant and animal distributions and they drew on various artistic media and methods to describe and categorize living beings. Today, by contrast, we assign the natural sciences the task of determining the world out there, while the arts, to the arts we assign the task of investigating the world in here, the emotive, subjective, and distinctly human. But if historical examples show that this division of labor is relatively recent, then we have to ask ourselves, do we want to maintain it? And if not, why not? Is it desirable for the natural sciences to be interested in lived, feeling, in lived experiences, feelings, and ethical norms? And is it desirable for the arts to generate new insights into the natural world? The answer, I believe, is yes. And it is precisely when this happens that we develop a form of knowing that can adequately respond to our current situation. <laughs>
So what is the alternative example I have in mind to justify all of these claims? As you might have guessed from the title of my talk, it is that of Alexander von Humboldt. Humboldt, who lived from 1769 to 1859, was arguable, arguably the most famous scientist of the 19th, 19th century. Often described as the father of American environmentalism and the founder of modern ecology, Humboldt is perhaps the first European thinker to develop a comprehensive vision of nature as a dynamic, organized, and developing unity. Some 20 years before Hegel, uh, sorry, Ernst Hegel <laughs> coined the term ecologie, Humboldt had articulated the idea of nature as a dynamic household, oikos, in which living beings and their surroundings develop in relation to one another. As he puts it in one of the first statements of his five volume cosmos, nature is a unity in multiplicity, the connection of the many in form and mixture of natural objects and natural forces as one living whole. It is this idea of nature as a dynamic household that underpins Humboldt's first concrete ecological observations, which he made in South America. In March 1800, Humboldt arrived at the once lush area of Lake Valencia or Lake Tacariqua. In contrast to his expectations, he encountered a region suffering from drought. Through conversations with indigenous locals, Creole farmers, and his own investigations, Humboldt came to a surprising conclusion. The felling of trees and the replacement of forests by farms had fundamentally transformed the climate and the soil. What was once a verdant area with regular rain had become a desert. This is how he puts it. When forests are destroyed as they are everywhere in America by European colonists, the springs dry up or become less abundant. The beds of the rivers remaining dry during part of the year become torrents whenever heavy rains fall from the heights. With the disappearance of sword and moss from the sides of the mountains, the waters falling in rain are no longer impeded in their course. And during heavy showers, instead of slowly augmenting the, lev the level of the rivers by progressive filtrations, they furrow the sides of the hills, bear down the loosened soil, and form those sudden inundations that devastate the country. And so it results that the destruction of the forests, the want of permanent springs, and the existence of torrents are three phenomena closely connected to one another. In this statement, Humboldt pointed to two crucial but hardly recognized facts. The influence of trees, forests, on the environment, and the influence of humans on the environment. While Humboldt's predecessors had recognized that living beings are affected by their environments, they had not considered how living beings themselves affect their environments. That is, how living beings, including humans, fundamentally transform the climate, soil, plants, and animals of a region. Humboldt's insight was radical for his time. What is surprising is that his insight remains radical today. Although it might appear to us as entirely straightforward, we continue to find it difficult to conceptualize the dynamic relationship between living beings and their environment. As biologist Sonia Sultan puts it in her 2015 book, Organism and Environment, this is Sultan. While conceptualizing the relationship between organisms and their environments is pivotal for both ecological and evolutionary investigations, it remains the case that in both disciplines, this relationship is seen generally as an interaction between separate entities. <laughs> 
in the sense that an individual whose traits are internally, that is genetically determined, confronts an externally defined and measurable environment. In other words, some 200 years after Humboldt, we remain bound to a notion of the environment that fails to take account of his ecological insight. For what he saw is that the environment is not a stable backdrop for animal and plant activity, but an ongoing collaboration between living beings and their surroundings. This means that the two, organism and environment, are absolutely interdependent. The one cannot exist without the other. The climate and soil of Lake Valencia cannot exist without the trees, and vice versa. The trees cannot exist without rain and nutrient-rich soil. To conceive of them as originally separate entities that then somehow come together is to misunderstand them and their relation. The difficulty that Sultan articulates was widely discussed by Humboldt's predecessors and his contemporaries. The 18th century French naturalist, Georges Louis Leclerc Buffon, put the matter in the following way. Our intellect proceeds linearly or sequentially. We move from one object to the next to the next. This is, however, not how nature proceeds. Rather, Buffon writes, nature does not take a single step except to go in all directions. In marching forward, she extends to the sides and above. The problem then is epistemological, having to do with an incommensurability between the way we know the world and the way the world is. We see objects as separate and grasp relations along a linear causal nexus. One thing moves and causes another to move. In nature, however, objects are interrelated and relations are manifold and multi-directional. Some 20 years after Buffon, Kant explicated the same difficulty, but from a slightly different angle. In the critique Der Urteilskraft, power of judgment, he argues that the reason we fail to understand living beings has to do with the character of our cognitive faculties. The fact that we proceed from one object to the next means that we can grasp only a certain kind of whole, a whole that is made up of separate pre-existing parts. A clock is one such whole. The bits and pieces that make up the clock are produced separately when they are put together, we have the clock. Living beings are not holes of this sort. Their various parts, the hearts, the lungs, the veins, and so on, don't emerge separately from one another. Rather, they emerge in relation to one another and as parts of a living body. Think of the formation of an embryo. This means that the structure of a living being is distinctly, distinctively different from the structure of other organized beings, such as a clock. The living being is not the outcome of separate parts that are brought together to make a whole. Rather, the parts can only exist in relation to one another within the context of the organism as a whole. This reveals a certain circularity in the structure of living beings. The parts exist only through the whole, and the whole exists only through the parts. And this circularity, Kant concludes, makes it impossible for us to properly grasp them. In short, our cognitive tendencies lead us to apprehend the world as composed of separate objects, whose relations are exclusively linear. And so, whether we are speaking of the relations between the parts of an organism or the relations between organisms and their environments, we separate that which is existentially and biologically inseparable. The question then is, how did Humboldt come to see organisms and their environments as a dynamic collaboration? How did he come to recognize that a particular environment does not pre-exist its inhabitants and that the inhabitants do not pre-exist the environment? <clears throat> 
In January 1806, Humboldt delivered his first lecture after returning from South America at the Prussian Academy of the Sciences in Berlin. There, he offers insights into his methodology and the knowledge he gained during his travels. Titled Ideen zu einer Physiognomie der Pflanzen, or Ideas for a Physiognomy of Plants, the lecture introduces Humboldt's audience to a new way of looking at the world, a way he calls physiognomy. Just as we discern a person's character through their gestures, body language, and expressions, so the physiognomist of nature, the new scientist that Humboldt wants to establish, discerns the character of a landscape through the expressions and gestures of plant and animal life. Accordingly, the physiognomist of plants is interested in those aspects of a plant that make the greatest impression on the viewer, whether the plant attains to great heights like palms or twists and turns like lianas, whether its leaves are broad like those of a banana tree or narrow like conifer needles. To elucidate the task of this new scientist, Humboldt looks to the landscape painter. Like the landscape painter, the physiognomist is interested in the overall impression that a landscape makes, in those expressive aspects which give the landscape its unique character. In contrast to a botanist who aims to categorize, distinguish, and separate plants, the physiognomist, like the landscape painter, binds them together. This means that the physiognomist must not see separate trees or distinct species, rather they must see trees in relation to one another, see them as members of the forest, and see the forest in them. To give his audience a concrete sense of what he means, Humboldt considers the diverging ways that a painter and a botanist treat leafy hardwoods, laupods. While the botanist distinguishes different hardwoods, oak, beech, walnut, the landscape painter allows them, as Humboldt puts it, to run one into the other, portraying them as members of a forest. This is because the painter is interested in capturing the overall impression that hardwoods make on the viewer, an impression that is connected to the fact that the different hardwoods grow in relation to one another and together form a distinctive forest. Trees, as you may know, take on different forms depending on where they grow. Consider the oak, one of the most beloved leafy hardwoods. A solitary oak growing on a hill looks decisively different from an oak growing in a forest. The crown of a solitary oak spreads out in all directions, eventually achieving a dome shape. By contrast, the forest oak develops a small crown and its growth pattern is modeled on the growth pattern of the other trees in the forests. An oak in a hardwood forest is an expression, not only of the individual tree or the genus oak, but also of the forest itself. The forest is not outside the individual oak tree, but literally inscribed in its very form. Just as the trees express the forest, so also the forest expresses the trees. The kind of forest it is, whether it is cool and humid or temperate and dry, whether its soil is nutrient rich or poor, how much carbon it stores and how much rain it receives, depends on its particular trees. The forest environment, in other words, is realized in and maintained through the activities of its trees. The forest is an expression of its trees just as much as the trees are an expression of the forest. By working with form, expression, and gesture, the landscape painter captures this relationship and thereby presents trees and forest, organism and environment as interdependent realities, as beings that emerge with and through one another. In this way, the landscape painter 
overcomes our cognitive tendency to separate entities that are internally connected and to conceive of relations in purely linear or sequential terms. For the painting presents at once or in one glance the manifold relations which our usual cognitive tendencies can only grasp in sequence. The aesthetic integrity of the painting is not merely an abstract formal quality, but also a communication of the sense of integrity of the environment that is depicted. From the landscape painter then, the natural scientist learns how to look at nature, not as a composite of separate entities, which are only externally related to one another, but as an ongoing and dynamic collaboration between beings that are internally dependent on one another. Depending on the lens through which we look, phenomena and ways of being emerge or hide, and our understanding is enriched or impoverished. Art, as Humboldt illustrates, may be the most powerful of these lenses. By drawing on modes of seeing that he learned from landscape painting, Humboldt sought to realize a deeper understanding of the world and to found a new encompassing discipline, the discipline we now call ecology. At this point, you might be wondering about Humboldt's use of landscape painting as an orientation for the scientist. After all, landscape painting is situated. What is, de what is depicted depends on where the painter happens to be and when. Furthermore, much of what is conveyed in a landscape painting is difficult to pin down and articulate in objective terms. The feeling of a place, its character and gestures involve the viewer as much as they involve the view. What is captured in the painting appears to lie somewhere between objectivity and subjectivity, for it refers to both the particular place that is depicted and the impressions and feelings that this place evokes. Impressions and feelings that are of this place, that reveal something about this place, but which nonetheless belong to a human subject. When it came to his own writings, Humboldt explicitly rejected the ideal of objectivity in science, which was becoming standard in the mid 19th century. This is because, he argued, science should offer living depictions of nature, not dead ones. That is, depictions that draw on and affect our imagination and draw on affect and imagination in order to deepen understanding. This does not mean turning away from truth. Rather, like landscape painting, Humboldt's writing, writings facilitate an encounter with the world, which, on the one hand, allows natural phenomena to express themselves to an attentive observer, and on the other, engage the observer, thereby revealing to her or him their, her own involvement. The lecture Humboldt gave in Berlin in 1806 was published two years later in a collection of essays titled Ansichten der Natur. In the preface, he explains that his aim is to join a literary with a purely scientific goal, such that each essay has both aesthetic and scientific ends. Like landscape paintings, the essays portray an aspect of nature, steps and deserts, waterfalls and rivers, jungles, and so on. But unlike landscape paintings, which capture a region through visual devices, the essays draw on all of our senses by describing not only the light, shape, and color of the landscape, but also its smells and sounds, its transformation from night to from day to night, seasonal changes as well as changes wrought by human, animal, and plant activity. The essays allow the reader to encounter nature as a dynamic process and to imagine herself walking, climbing, or riding through it. The first essay in the collection concerning steppes and deserts begins by situating the reader, the reader, imaginatively placing her in a particular spot. 
the foot of a high granite mountain, or as Humboldt puts it, granite spine. Immediately, the reader is invited not only to picture the mountain, but to stand at its foot. From there, her gaze turns southward and rests on a broad, immeasurable plain, the steppes or llanos. What the reader sees is not a God's eye view of the landscape, but the steps as they appear from a particular angle. This angle colors her impression. The steps seem to climb and dwindle into the horizon. Having walked to the steps from the lush valleys of Caracas, the reader is also struck by the sudden change in the landscape from the luxuriant fullness of organic life to the barren edge of a sparse and treeless desert and feels astonished. By invoking all of the reader's senses, her feelings and imagination, as well as her body, Humboldt's essays invite the reader to become the wanderer, to imagine what it is like to watch the clouds thickening over the steppes for trending months of rain and to sense the constriction in the atmosphere, to imagine what it is like to hear the sudden and deafening cries of hundreds of animals in the jungle in the dead of night, or what it is like to stand on the banks of the Orinoco for hours in torrential rain. In reading these descriptions, we do not only think about the particu a particular aspect of nature, nor do we simply see it from a specific standpoint. We also imagine ourselves in the landscape, experiencing it in an embodied and emotive way. Interwoven within these vivid descriptions and careful observations, are detailed measurements of various phenomena, as well as comparative historical and geographic analyses. The technical details and scientific explanations are not separated from the embodied experiences, but emerge from them. For instance, the feeling of a constricted atmosphere motivates careful observation of cloud formation before an electric storm while the sense of, the sh of shock at the sudden deluge in the steppes leads to insights about animal adaptation, how the cows and horses that had for months survived in arid conditions had suddenly become amphibian-like, struggling with new predators in a new habitat. And when the wanderer journeys from South America to Africa, she is surprised by the vastly different impressions that, these, that their respective landscapes inspire. This leads her to reflect on their deep histories and geographies and to offer reasons for why the African desert, the Sahara, is so arid in comparison to the South American one. But these feelings are not mere stimulants which are put aside once scientific explanation begins. They remain and serve to anchor scientific insights in the reality of lived experience. As responses to the world, openings onto phenomena, the feelings and impressions are not subjective, having only to do with the wanderer's inner life. Rather, in the same way that a landscape painting conveys the character of a region by capturing its expressive forms, so these feelings and impressions reveal something about the phenomena. The astonishment that we feel in suddenly gazing on the vast barren steppes has to do with the stark difference in character from the, in their stark difference of character from the lush valleys. While the sense of constriction before an electric storm reflects the heaviness of the air, the sudden closeness of the horizon and the intensifying clouds. In and through these feelings, the landscape expresses itself to the attentive observer and thereby ceases to be a mute indifferent object. But just as feeling anchors reflection, so reflection informs and shifts feeling. Throughout the essays, feelings and reflection enable, expand, and transform one another. This is perhaps most vivid in Humboldt's description of the practice of so-called horse fishing, where wild horses are corralled into a pond filled with electric eels. 
The idea is that in electrocuting the large animals, the eels will exhaust themselves and can easily be caught. In the instance Humboldt describes, horse fishing was undertaken on his bidding as he was fascinated by the phenomenon of animal electricity. To begin with, we feel a certain excitement and curiosity in connection with the strangeness of the phenomena of electric fish. However, as we observe the horse's repeated attempts to flee the scene, witness their strained bodies and the panic in their eyes, excitement wanes and in its place emerge shock and concern. What we feel disrupts the narrative. And as we read the essay's final paragraphs, the panic in the horse's eyes and the emotion it evokes haunts our reflections. In this instance, feeling challenges and expands thinking. It challenges us to think again and think more deeply about human actions and their values, about animal suffering and its needs. What we find in Humboldt's essays then are scientific works of art, however contradictory this term might at first appear. Works in which feeling and thinking are in the service of one another, where each is willing to be challenged, expanded and transformed by the other. Feeling is not a mere means by which to communicate the data that Humboldt collected, rather it inspires, shapes and transforms intellectual and moral consideration and is also shaped and transformed by them. In this way, Humboldt's essays reveal to the reader a different way of being in and understanding the world, a way that is not neutral and detached, but passionately involved in and affected by the dy a dynamic world. And they do this not purely theoret theoretically, by addressing the reader as a sensing, feeling, and thinking being, as a whole self, the essays generate and enact this way, this richer way of being in and knowing the world. Through reading the essays, we encounter ourselves and the world differently. It becomes evident that our experience of the world is mediated by feeling, and that these feelings are both of the world and of us. We realize that who we are is inextricably connected to the world in which we live, the world that touches us and is touched by us. The world no longer appears to be simply or primarily an object to be studied, but a world of which we are part, a world that speaks to us and affects us, that is in us as much as we are in it. We begin to understand that we are not outside nature, but inside it. And the mistake emerges when we imagine otherwise. In the summer of 2019, as fires raged across Australia, Danielle Selemeyer wrote a series of essay for the Australian Broadcasting Service, in which she describes her experience of the fires that threatened her home in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales and took the life of Katie, one of the two pigs she cares for. On New Year's Eve, with her home in peril, Danielle made her way to Sydney, only to be shocked by the celebratory mood in the city. In contrast to her neighbors who had been dealing with an existential threat, city dwellers, while aware of the fires, had only experienced them abstractly, as one news item among many. On New Year's Eve, they were waiting only for a party. What Danielle witnessed on that day was, as she put it, two Australias, an Australia for whom fire was a real existential threat, and an Australia for whom the catastrophes remained abstract. Information news items, but not realities. The environmental crisis is a crisis of knowledge, but also of sense and imagination. 
or more specifically, of the separation of knowing from sensing, feeling, and acting, and the separation of the natural sciences from the arts. It is a crisis that has to do with a chasm within us. We know, but we don't really know. Where the kind of knowledge we cultivate is disconnected from the reality in which we live. Or better, where our very practices of knowing actively disconnect us from this reality. In a time of crisis, what we need is to retether our knowledge to the world, to sense, affect, and lived experience. Only in this way will we overcome the split that undermines knowledge, making it passive and impotent. What we need is a form of knowing that emerges from and speaks to our whole selves, to our senses, imagination, and understanding. A knowledge that moves us and motivates us because it reveals in a visceral way that what, happen, what happens out there does have to do with what happens in here. That nature's fate is also our fate. This form of knowledge is what Humboldt sought to achieve and why he rejected objectivity in science. And it is also what we must seek to realize. Thank you.